I would uh, like to again express my appreciation for that unique introduction. And Jerry, if you'll take this third lecture and summarize it equally well, we can go home early. <laughs> it is an international uh, privilege to be introduced by Jerry Zeman and uh, to identify in just a small way with the value and importance of uh, his own work. Actually, tonight, what I'd like to do is just have voluntary suggestions from the audience, and uh, we'll build a lecture in the last 15 minutes, and you'll get the point about what voluntarism really is and how really uh, confused and interlocking some of the ideas are. Jerry told me not to do that. Better keep faith with the schedule. <clears throat> a quote to begin with from one of my own historical heroes, the reverend, or lack thereof, George Fox, from his journal in 1648. The priest of an Anglican church asked me what a church was. I told him the church was the pillar and ground of truth, made up of living stones, living members, a spiritual household which Christ was the head of. But Christ was not the head of a mixed multitude or of an old house made up of lime, stones, and wood. George Fox referred to churches when they were identified as buildings as steeple houses full of mixed multitudes, not brought together by the voluntary persuasion of God's people. Voluntarism can get carried away, and in the talkback sessions, it's become obvious that it really can be a very serious risk to the church, even the churches that believe so uh, very intensely in the principle of voluntarism. It can even become, as we Baptists know, and non Baptists who have entered the so called independent realm of Christian organization an end in itself. What keeps voluntarism in creative tension, I believe, by God's spirit, is community. And so, having described where it can go and where it came from, I think, ideologically, in several different rootages, I want to focus tonight on how the church, we're back talking about the church again, has tried to put the best of the voluntary principle in creative tension with the need to be one in Christ, to be a community. No voluntary association is alone, despite all the disclaimers of independent and uh, complete autonomy. The church is no exception. We move once again to the church because that's where voluntarism is bridal, not stopped, but brought under control. And when the free church is at its best, uh, voluntarism and community are in a very healthy, dynamic relationship. Let's keep that in mind as we look at four examples tonight of how voluntarily organized, voluntarily concerned, groups of Christian people have tried to work out what a theology of the church should mean and look like. Along the way, each of the four models we shall explore in succession, the Mennonites, the Baptists, the Quakers, and the Disciples, each of the four models grudgingly surrendered congregational decision-making processes to other extra-congregational bodies. And eventually, each of these voluntary traditions evolved in a predictable pattern and structure which provided both for their survival and the maintenance of their fundamental identity. But before we get into the four models, let me suggest some issues or problems that I think we need to keep in mind, some presuppositions. First, there is an inherent tendency, modern social scientists tell us, for congregations within a similar confession or family heritage or social context to cooperate for specific purposes. 
This tendency gradually leads to integrated structural longevity and identity. Even the most independent and autonomous of Christian groups somehow find ways to associate with like-minded people. Second, there is a transatlantic culture of organized voluntarism which displays streams of heritage from Europe to the United States and Canada, a fascinating tradition in the free church uh, mold. It identifies quite neatly, if you will, with the more um, traditional models of the Roman Catholic, the Church of England, Lutheran, and Reformed heritages. Third, a central question for each of these churches, and I suggest for every one of us in religious culture as well, concerns the nature of the visible church. Is the local body of believers complete in itself? How do we make any sense theologically if all the pieces of the voluntary associations about the edges and even within the church? A fourth comment I would make at the outset is when I talk about denomination, I mean an organization with a mature self-understanding and perception which adopts specific goals, maintains consistent cooperation among its constituent parts, and develops a structure for action and accountability. Thus, Baptists, however disparate they are, are a denomination. And so, Roman Catholics in modern voluntary religious culture are a denomination. Fifth, and finally, by way of presupposition, it is the institutionalized version, what we're going to be talking about tonight, of voluntarism in denominational form, which has given consistent witness to and defense of voluntarism itself. That is a very important function and foundation for the continuing voluntary tradition. Put another way, we hear more about voluntarism from Christian church structures. They are very protective of the principle. The problem with the associations that we spoke about last night, and which I shall make further reference to tomorrow evening in the final lecture, is that they are so focused heavily on the issue that brought them into being that they take for granted the social context in which they operate and also the principles which are very dear to their very survival. I have chosen the four groups, Mennonites, Baptists, Quakers, and Disciples, because each of them displays a unique pattern of voluntarism in transatlantic culture from Europe to North America. Each of them has an experience in the old world and a unique experience in the United States and in Canada. So, allow me the time to test the models. First, the community of Mennonites. Historians since Ernst Trelz, and I suspect a lot earlier than him, have underscored the Anabaptist vision as the seed of the sectarian principles of the free churches, which includes voluntarism, separation of church and state, and freedom of religion. The Anabaptist movement began in debates over the nature of the church, authority, and the principle of reformation itself, particularly in the early 16th century. The movement spread, the Anabaptist movement that is, through Switzerland via Balthasar Hubmeier, South Germany via leaders like Hans Denk and Hans Hut, in Strasbourg through Pilgrim Marpeck and Melchior Hoffman in the Netherlands. Out of the Hoffmanite preaching in the Netherlands and the influence of the Munster Reformation doctrines, Menno Simons, 1492 to 1559 to date him, in 1536 announced his conversion from the Roman Catholic faith to Anabaptistic views, a point of momentous importance in the Anabaptist heritage. Subsequently, he devoted his time to Bible study and, if you will, underground leadership of the Dutch Anabaptist community, which soon came to be called Mennonists or Mennonites. Mennonite fellowships were established across northern Europe and likely in England by the mid-16th century. 
as the number of Mennonite groups increased, the term used in the Mennonite group to denote religious bodies was Gemeinde, which is usually translated by uh, writers that aren't that uh, interested in the nuances involved as church. It literally means community, and that's a very important point more and more in the making of modern Mennonite community. Between 1550 and 1650, Mennonites suffered from internal schism and external persecutions. Various temporary solutions allowed for European and Russian solace. Ultimately, it was in North America that Mennonites found the freedom to develop long-term and in large numbers, relatively speaking, their unique forms of life and community. The first settlers arrived on the continent in 1644, with many going directly later generations to Pennsylvania. After the American War for Independence, numerous Mennonite families moved to Canada to be joined later by European immigrants from Alsace, Bavaria, and Russia. The Mennonite family in North America also eventually came to include the <coughs> Amish and Hutterite communities, not, by the way, integral to or necessarily predictably cooperative with Mennonites proper. I found it very interesting this past uh, summer when I represented the Baptist World Alliance at the Mennonite World Conference to find such a happy historical blend on in some of the books and pamphlets of what I had felt were extremely disparate and unrelated groups in the greater Anabaptist family. And I asked Paul Craybill, the General Secretary of the Mennonite Conference, how that could be. And he smiled and he said, only here, only once every six years. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> only a General Secretary could say that. Several factors kept the Mennonite voluntary community intact from Europe to North America and across over three centuries. The first and most obvious was a common heritage of suffering and martyrdom. The almost constant movement of Mennonite peoples and interactions mostly negative with government leaders on the issue of religious liberty presented each generation with a new sense, a renewed sense of struggle. In 1615, von Brock published his classic Martyr's Mirror, which literarily enshrined countless people who had died for their faith. A very precious book, I find, in most Mennonite households, right next to the scriptures. Two other factors which promoted Mennonite community were language and familial bonds. Whether in Tsarist Russia or English North America, Mennonites have created a very complex system of human relationships which include marriage networks, friendship structures, and mutual assistance projects like barn raising and quilt sewing for world relief, as well as generally living in close proximity to each other. Moreover, the German or Dutch languages and literary heritages with them have united the Mennonite community in a vivid way. For instance, after many generations in Russia, I was astounded to listen to people in Manitoba this year and find that many Mennonite immigrants to Canada still cherish the German language as a common bond. Finally, the distinct nature of Mennonite lifestyle accentuated in the public mind by Amish and Hutteran practices and clothing lend visible identity to Mennonite groups in a rapidly modernizing society, whether it's Pennsylvania, Ontario, or Manitoba. Calvin Redekop, one of the outstanding social historians of the tradition, has pointed out how important this matter of community is as a model to Mennonites in creating and maintaining folkways, food recipes, who doesn't have a Mennonite cookbook, mutual aid, schools, harvesting bees, and economic exchanges. The sense of community is, of course, derived from the Mennonite religious tradition.
The government of Mennonites in Europe was solely congregational. It remained so in early America until the 18th century. About 1725, ministers of local congregations met informally to discuss matters of faith and life. The oldest bishop usually presided over the meetings. By the late 19th century, these meetings became district conferences, which set the disciplinary standards for congregations. Bishops or regional pastors evolved as key figures in decision-making for the churches in their care. What became the Mennonite General Conference in 1898 evolved from the specialization of benevolence, education, and publication efforts and later boards, whose authority in the community was delegated by the bishops and religious conferences. Support for the conference and the agencies of cooperation came from voluntary, and I might add very generous, church contributions. In the 1840s, waves of change swept across the Mennonite community in both the United States and Canada. The evangelical movement, the Second Great Awakenings in the United States, called for increased Bible study, prayer, and social action. Among Mennonites, this meant less attention to outward forms or tradition. Under additional pressure from new Mennonite immigrants who settled in the American Midwest and in the west of Ontario and the Canadian Plains, a voluntarist reaction set in among many of the regional conferences. Beginning in Pennsylvania with John H. Oberholzer, a new order emerged around increased congregational authority, openness to other Christians, and a generally more democratic structure. These new Mennonites formed something called, and this is mind-boggling to get it straight, the General Conference Mennonite Church in 1860 with provision for itinerant ministry, education, and foreign missions, typical voluntary benevolent concerns. The conference drew many of, its new, of the new immigrants directly from Europe who were comfortable with the German language and pioneer status of the new structure. Most attractive, however, was a guarantee of the congregational freedom of churches. Waterloo in this country, a center, Waterloo, Ontario, a center of Mennonite culture, became the focus of organization beyond the congregations in Canada. Consulting bishops moved in the same way, about 1835, to become the core of an annual structure called the Canada Conference, with again bishops holding semi-annual meetings within their respective districts. Militating against much wider fellowship in the 19th century was, of course, the great expanse of Canadian territory and a firm commitment to congregational authority. As in the United States, reforming voluntarist tendencies among Canadian Mennonites set in as well. In Canada, it was Daniel Hoke, who, being very fond of and influenced by Methodist techniques, drew together a number of dissenting Mennonites, congregationally speaking, for more evangelical means than the older style churches. Hoke advocated more modern dress, contact with other Christians, and missionary endeavor. He joined forces with Oberholzer in the U.S and became part of the more democratic General Conference of Mennonites. And in Canada, yet a third division, which prospered on the Canadian prairies under the ministry of Solomon Eby, an evangelist caught up in the fires of protracted meetings. Eby was instrumental in forming a theologically evangelical uh, set of congregations on both sides of the border into a reform group which eventually took the name Mennonite Brethren in Christ. The body, Mennonite Brethren in Christ, had a tendency towards strong centralized conferences led by Methodist-style superintendents, far more authoritative, I might add, than the traditional Mennonite bishops against whom they originally reacted in part. In each context, Mennonites, as much as any other example of voluntarism, and surely a lot longer, exhibit the basic tension 
in a voluntary religious organization. It is the preservation of a spirit of freedom and self-involvement along with consistent cooperation, conflict resolution, and the efficiency of an organization. From the 16th century to the present, Mennonites have affirmed the, that the Bible, as interpreted within the congregation, is supremely authoritative. Every church member is a believer priest from the voluntary confession of faith and acceptance in the congregational membership. Every congregation, and here's where we begin to move beyond individuals, every congregation is organized independently and fully empowered. There is no executive power beyond the local congregation, and that specifically delegated when it does occur in terms of program action to the regional conferences. But it was Menno Simons himself who realized that congregations needed leadership. He called them shepherds, and he provided for the means to elect the most gifted and experienced as leaders. Thus, from the earliest stages of the tradition, a classic conflict of personal authority versus congregational authority, and then congregational authority versus regional congregations uh, emerged in the bishop's role and in other groupings, congregations evolving to an informal accountability beyond themselves. Major reform in the 19th century among Mennonites in North America and in Western Europe called for a reaffirmation of congregational authority and a democratization of decision-making processes fundamental to the voluntary tradition. These reforms were embodied first, as I said, in the General Conference Mennonite Organization and later in some of the splinter groups. The overall sense of Mennonite community is redefined within the voluntary organizations as Mennonites within a given conference tradition attempt intentionally to live near each other and work intimately with each other, thus reinforcing their old folk ways and the overall patterns of community important to the Mennonite tradition. In later development, two voluntary organizations have greatly assisted the identification and cautious overall coalition, very cautious, of the various Mennonite bodies. The first is the Mennonite Central Committee. Founded in 1920, it provides a coordinating body of all the Mennonite family groups for world relief and special projects. The Amish, the various Mennonite groups, Hutterites, Brethren in Christ, all support the MCC without much more than an historical accountability to Mennonite denominationalism, sort of a nostalgic form of voluntary denomination. The other, the Mennonite World Conference, first convened in 1925, serves as an ongoing international community meeting of Mennonite family bodies and members for fellowship, intradenominational activities, inspiration, and a clearinghouse for statistics and progress. You've never heard Christians sing a cappella until you've been to a 16,000 member song service with the Mennonite World Conference. The meetings of the MWC held every six years go far in establishing a network of relationships for an otherwise very disparate group of Christians. While the Mennonite World Conference has a small paid staff, its vitality, to be sure, is based on the goodwill and financial support voted by the member bodies. In neither the MCC or the MWC, Mennonite authorities insist, is there any hint of a super church. Both are kept non-legislative and must cope, and I quote from the Constitution, with the Mennonite polity of protecting at all costs the integrity and independence of conferences and congregations. Thus, Mennonites continue to affirm their structural essence as voluntary, bound together by a deep sense of folkways and community.
And that is a very important metaphor that reaches very much into every part of the Mennonite tradition. Community, metaphor number one. Now for the Baptists. It was very difficult for me not to uh, spend the rest of the evening writing about Baptists because there are so many of us and we're so confused about what we mean when we associate with each other. Influenced indirectly by strains of the Anabaptist and specifically the Mennonite movement, Baptist evolved, as most of us know, from the Puritan separatist tradition of English Protestantism in the 17th century. First in England and later in the US and British North America, Baptists followed something called an associational principle, which has allowed them to express through their extra congregational bodies and relationships, and here are words that are important to our body, autonomy and interdependence. Baptist stress is upon structure. Within the first decade of the establishment of the Baptist congregations, clusters of churches were created to seek advice on matters of doctrine and polity and to provide mutual assistance under the stress of establishment persecutions. Eventually, regional associations grew up, and it was the term association right from the beginning at the uh, behest of Cromwell's army and where it moved and other evangelical techniques. By the 1660s, Baptists enjoyed the networks throughout England and Wales of voluntary relationships which created a definite sense of the larger church and also an ecclesiocracy, the latter through messengers and superintendents and traveling elders. A key period in the development of British Baptist denominational identity was from 1810 to 1830. Within that time frame, five voluntary groups or organizations developed closer ties, all of the societies and uh, associational networks, which eventually led to a concerted, coordinated denominational structure called the Baptist Union of Great Britain and Ireland. And recently, I understand, they dropped the Irish. Since 1831, the Baptist Union has served as a clearinghouse for auxiliary organizations, a forum for theological debates, and a significant bonding instrument for churches of varied styles. Throughout its history, the Union has remained true, though, to the original voluntary design. This society, its constitution says, disclaims all manner to superiority and superintendence over the churches or any authority or power to impose anything upon their faith and practice. Their sole intention is to be helpers together one of another. Baptists in the United States followed similar patterns to those in Great Britain. The associational principle was established in the 1690s and it held together loose regional confederations of churches for the next hundred years. It was the domestic missionary movement with its focus upon western New York, Ohio country, yes, and the Canadas, which led to the establishment of voluntary societies in its second phase. Baptists, by the way, relied very heavily upon congregational and Presbyterian theories and practices of organization. The chief difference being the separation of the confessional bodies from the single purpose voluntary societies. For American Baptists, the apex of organizational development occurred in 1814 and lasted for only three decades when the General Convention of the Baptist Denomination in the United States of America for Foreign Missions, affectionately known as Gib Baptusma, <laughs> or the Triennial Convention, was founded um, actually an amalgamation of the executive principle of congregational uh, life in the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions and the regional Baptist mission societies. For three decades only, glorious decades, we were one. Delegates from financially supportive churches plus individuals acted on issues relating to missionary endeavor and public policy. They started a national university as well. Only when the convention was accused of legislating on the controversial issue 
of slavery, the S word, did local churches and southern associational bodies object and retreat from a national connectional body and form a distinctly southern convention. Taking great liberties with my own heritage, I will finish my discussion of Baptist life in America by saying that in the next century and a half, both Northern and Southern Baptist in the United States experienced extreme localistic tendencies. Some called it landmarkism, some called it local church protectionism. In reaction to that localism, Baptist in the North established a presbyterial form of covenanting organizations. And Southern Baptist revised or revived the regional association idea to grow dramatically fivefold in this century alone. In many regions, American Baptist and Southern Baptist organizations are seen as competing church polities, such as in Illinois or California or Kansas. In a very few, there is some semblance of cooperation. The Canadian associational experience rounds out our Baptist paradigm with a unique character. Remember, in the missionary advance of Baptist worldwide, the character of Baptist life in the two-thirds world is drawn by whether missionaries were from Britain, the United States, or Canada. The Baptist mainstream or convention experience in Canada illustrates the limitations inherent in a voluntary religious system with no organic unity beyond reasonable regional boundaries and with limited legislative authority in representative bodies. Significantly, I think, Baptist in what would become modern Canada experienced no contextual nationalistic tendency until the late 19th century like what occurred in the United States 75 to 80 years before. It was in the maritime provinces that a unique model, which I think characterizes most of Canadian Baptist polity, emerged called the Union Society Movement, which provided the catalyst to establish an all-important regionalism in Canadian life. It was actually Alexander Sowers, a prominent Halifax medical examiner and former Episcopalian who was a leader of the Granville Street Baptist Church, who proposed in 1842 the creation of Union Societies and gave the model to the Maritime Convention eventually. These bodies fostered coordination of benevolent projects such as education, foreign and home missions, and printing, and they led to a greater sense of denominational identity. Sauer's plan assisted the raising of funds for Baptist causes, and it was his very close friend, uh, E. A. Crawley, down the street in the graveyard, who helped to establish Acadia University on much the same model, providing a tangible institutional expression of regional importance. It was also in this family of Union Societies that T.H. Chipman and T.S. Harding of the church in this town established an historical collection to try and kindle the flame of Baptist connectionalism in the region. A regional denominational convention was the result in 1836, the first of its kind in what is now Canada. The convention collected statistics, supported a common periodical, the Christian messenger, and authorized fraternal delegates and itinerants to travel in its name. It was proud, by the way, of the word denomination. The story is much more complex in Ontario and Quebec, where there were five false starts to try and put together a united vision for the larger church, and likewise in the West, where it was not until 1907 that several groups in the West formed the Baptist Union of Western Canada in part to coordinate mission endeavor, in part to consolidate administration. Beyond the associations and the regions, Canadian Baptist polity, which in many ways is uh, the turning upside down, the inverse of British and United States experience, exhibits an historic emphasis upon 
regional structures in three basic sub-denominations, the Maritimes, Ontario and Quebec, and of course the West. Exceptions, like with the Mennonites, to this autonomous regionalization are the Canadian Baptist Overseas Mission Board, founded in 1911, and of course the Canadian Baptist Federation, which by mandate shall not duplicate any convention activities and is carefully funded to make sure that it won't. <laughs> Canadian Baptist, I'm sorry Dick Coffin is not here to respond to that, Canadian Baptists cling tenaciously to a voluntarist theology of the church and its wider relationships. Hear this poetic version adopted by the BCOQ in 1982. The believing community must be free to seek and follow his will. The local church manages its own affairs in accordance with divine guidance. The local church freely cooperates with other congregations through associations and conventions in the furtherance of Christ's will. Baptists, probably more than any other voluntary religious movements, have also experienced, and here it comes, a high degree of schism, manifesting a disintegrative tendency for the denomination as a whole. In England, London area Baptists concerned about the growing tendency toward open communion exercised their voluntary rights and followed the mind of Christ and formed the Baptist Evangelical Society, better known as the Strict Baptists. Jesus was strict and so should we be. In the United States, Baptists in their 200 year history have formed about 200 new bodies over theological issues, free will Baptist, social identity, black Baptist, and regional issues, Southern Baptists. Canadian Baptists have likewise not escaped the schismatic tendency over theological modernization with a group, of course, known as the Fellowship Baptist in the 1920s. From the perspective of the new organizations, the Strict Baptists, the Fellowship Baptist, and so forth, it is the older convention bodies that represent a form of establishment as surely obnoxious as the Church of England was to everybody in the Baptist family in the early 17th century. Those uh, bodies see the conventions as imposing unbaptistic controls and influences over individual congregations and violating the voluntary principle. Come out or Baptists thus give the appearance of a purer form of voluntarism than their parent bodies. Baptists then answer the question, what is the visible church by the associational principle? The Quakers and their sent meeting. At roughly the same period when Baptists were born, the Society of Friends made its mark in English Protestantism, certainly as a non-conforming sect and with its own highly differentiated variety and metaphor of voluntary cooperation. George Fox, the founder of the Society of Friends in the 1640s, traveled broadly, and he's a key person in my argument, among Baptists, Mennonites, and other Quakers, or other dissenters in Europe and North America. He spent a good deal of time on a lecture circuit in which he publicly denounced the institutional church with its steeple houses and moral laxity. Initially, he had no desire to form any new sect Thus, he used names like Children of Light, Friends in the Truth, to obscure any denominational sense. Instead, he strove to bring renewal to the existing church. It is not surprising that Quakers were very slow in maturing organizationally. But the first pattern and metaphor emerged in the East Riding Friends Meeting or Friends Organization in 1652. There is probably the first place publicly that the metaphor of meeting was used in a formal way. Its purpose was to be a general conference on matters of necessary arrangement once every three weeks. Fox had been dependent upon the seekers and other nonconformist sects for the pattern as his journal shows. 
gathering ever more broadly from the regions about East Riding, the dynamic of the early lay meetings was to wait together for a word from the Lord, not to form any external covenant. The idea of meeting then becomes a powerful symbol and metaphor for Quaker voluntarism. By 1654, just two years later, supporters of Fox recognized the need for organized support. Friends refused to pay tithes, but they collected great amounts of money and uh, goods for uh, the relief of prisoners, the purchase and printing of books and tracts, clothing and travel expenses for their leaders. These funds were called stocks and they were collected on a county basis. From the General Baptist in England, the Quakers borrowed the idea of eldership. There was a traveling ministry like the Baptist messengers to plant congregations, to superintend business and evangelize because among the Quakers it was the elders who presided over the monthly and general meetings. Early Quakers were not unaware of the need to look like other religious communities. They soon devised systems for registration of births, marriages, and deaths, which paralleled that and were as accurate of, as those of the established church. Discipline was also important to Fox, and it helped to organize the religious community. Worldliness, dishonesty, and spiritual laziness were subjects of sermons, investigations, and admonitions to those who were not fully attentive to the soon coming day of the Lord. It was benevolence collection, though, within and without the meetings, which brought about the maturing voluntary organization. Margaret Fell, one of Fox's closest friends, of Swarthmore, called upon elders in the Westmoreland district to collect funds for missions. This initial free will offering produced over 252 pounds sterling and began the long-term concern of the Friends community for one another through regular channels. Soon the monthly meetings were directed by quarterly meetings and finally by yearly meetings, all having a religious tone following the leading of the Spirit. Each meeting, though, was autonomous in the disbursement of its own funds, and any controlling authority in the society continued to originate in form and rest in the monthly meeting, which was always at the center of Quaker life. During the Restoration, Quaker organization was essentially completed. There were two types of yearly meetings, one for ministers at which prayer and religious concerns were treated, the other primarily a business session. Reports indicate that some of those meetings lasted for up to three days and included three or four thousand people. Flexibility, local autonomy, and simplicity characterized Quakers. Flexibility was inherent in the system of benevolences. Fox and his followers were careful to guarantee the decision-making capabilities of the local meetings. When conflict emerged in a meeting, the matter in question was set aside until additional friends could add their sense of resolution. The voluntarism followed the extent, the extent of spiritual or communal revelation. The system of organization which Fox desired was remarkably successful in America and in Canada. Between 1680 and 1710, there were formed 45 monthly meetings and six quarterly meetings. The Canadian uh, yearly meeting grew out of the New York meeting of 1867. Three important characteristics in North America tested the voluntary nature of the Society of Friends, just like with the Baptist and the Mennonites written disciplines, the threat of schism, and the second great awakening. Here, Quakers began to take a completely different uh, tonal quality in their voluntarism. Meetings were to be conducted in a much more orderly fashion. Ministers were appointed in the United States and Canada as overseers, and then overseers among regional <coughs> meetings were 
appointed or elected as well, usually coming from devout families forming a kind of elite. Schism among the American friends was also uh, a catalyst for reorganization and it touched upon the Canadian yearly meeting as well. Schism over moral laxity, worldliness, and outward forms. Orthodox leaders established more hierarchy. Hicksites and others stressed the inner life of the spirit and eventually ended up cooperating with transcendentalists. The so-called Second Great Awakening provided the backdrop for the introduction of the holiness concern and perfectionism among the Quakers. Believe it or not, Quakers in the U.S. and Canada in the 1850s were involved in the camp meeting crusades and experiences. Especially attractive to Quakers at that point were doctrines like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The revivals produced a desire among many friends for consistent voluntary leadership over and against the old quietistic style of the meetings. The first Quakers in Canada had come for uh, basically commercial reasons. Uh, the center of Quaker life emerged in Ontario and the uh, areas to the west. Over the years, Quakers came to be dominated in their life and patterns by outside influences, particularly Methodism, and in fact by uh, the 1950s, Quakers had become a very small minority in Canada. They had ex exhibited very little growth and in fact had been shaped in their voluntary principles more by external forces than by care to their own self-understanding. In the 19th century, voluntary associations became very important to the Quakers. Uh, Anti-slavery, prison reform, women's rights, and Quaker historians point out how the system of meetings was flexible enough to allow for that sort of ever-emerging voluntarism to be included in the sense of meeting as well. The Society of Friends, born out of a highly individualized form of transatlantic voluntarism, has created a structure with sufficient space for contemporary concerns and experimentation. The meeting was their important metaphor. Finally, the Brotherhood and the Disciples. An outgrowth of Scottish Presbyterian and Baptist movements, the Disciples of Christ represent the radical fringe of voluntary problems and perhaps the greatest tension of all within mainstream Protestantism as far as the voluntary principle is concerned. You will recall that it was the hyphenated identity of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, that came from Barton W. Stone, a Presbyterian figure who was a central figure in the great revival of Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801. Stone formed with other dissenters a group called the Christian Church. He believed that each particular church as a body attracted by the same spirit should choose her own preacher and support him by a free will offering, admit members, remove offenses, and never delegate any of her rights of government to any man or set of men whatsoever. The second radical root of the movement was Alexander Campbell. With his father, Thomas, they were very active in the early years of Alexander's career in the Seceder Presbyterian Church in Scotland and Ireland, where they were considered well-educated and uh, good, high-quality teachers and leaders. Among the influences which were primary in the Campbell's early experience were the Haldane brothers, John Wesley, and George Whitfield. But it was the factionalism and the uh, lack of consensus in the Presbyterian circumstances that led them to seek a new life and a new destiny in religious culture in the United States and Canada. The Campbells moved to find cheap lands in western Pennsylvania about the early 19th century, 1807 to be exact. Within two years, the local presbytery in Pennsylvania had charged Thomas and his son with doctrinal deviations, and in May 1809, they happily withdrew from Presbyterianism. 
For a time, they were among the Baptists in the uh, association in that area, but went on to form their own brand of voluntary society dedicated to Christian union with the Bible as its only source of authority. The Christian Association of Washington, Pennsylvania was an open body which met twice a year for worship, business, and benevolence collection. In 1811, the association was constituted officially as a church with Thomas as elder and Alexander as pastor. Leadership here is of critical importance. Alexander Campbell, as everyone knows, became an outstanding and outspoken itinerant and debater. He was, for many, the quintessential voluntarist. A combative debater, he claimed to be a reformer seeking to restore the primitive faith of the New Testament. Many churches and many associations were painfully divided over Campbellism, especially with his original peculiar view that any organization beyond the local church was invalid on scriptural principles. On January the 1st, 1832, Barton Stone's Christian movement formally merged with Alexander Campbell's disciple. And for all the time since, we've all lived with a hyphenated identity, Christian Church dash Disciples of Christ. There were differences to be sure, but the more important issue was voluntary unionism. Alexander Campbell realized that his original antipathy toward extra-parish organizations had been a blunder. He watched the Methodist and Baptists grow. He encouraged evangelists under his leadership to itinerate and to bring clusters of churches together in annual meetings for preaching and fellowship. Gradually, regional and state yearly meetings came to sponsor evangelists, new church development, and Bible colleges. He came to Canada in his high 80s and formed one of the first conferences here. Much more significant, though, than all of that structure for the disciples was their homebred metaphor, brotherhood. In an editorial in December 1844 printed in the Christian record, the spirit of brotherhood was defined as making labor easy, suffering agreeable, and association delightful. There is a bond of union, wrote Campbell, between kindred spirits in Christ, which neither time, nor accident, nor misfortune can destroy. It overlooks natural distractions, sectional prejudices, and selfish inducements, and it lives in the future. For a movement which had experienced extreme voluntarism and isolation, Brotherhood proved to be a helpful antidote for over a century. As Clark Gilpin at the University of Chicago has shown, brotherhood was the nurturing environment for individual piety. And rather than build on creeds or structures, disciples gave to brotherhood a function analogous to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. For the next century of disciples' history, the central problem would be how would the brotherhood express itself as the larger church? That came through the establishment of the International Christian Missionary Association and the structures that evolved in the United States and Canada, but not without a price. Over two-thirds by 1900 of those churches in the United States associated with the brotherhood dropped out as the Churches of Christ independently organized over a fear of increasing ecclesiasticism and organizationism and the use, curiously, of instrumental music, which to them was a symbol of all that was wrong, both about modern biblical interpretation and ecclesiastical structures. The same formula applied in Canada. By 1950, two-thirds of the churches originally in the Disciples' Movement had dropped out to be part of other groups, from the United Church to the Churches of Christ to simply independent status. By the 1950s, the Disciples had reached an acute intellectual and theological crisis in their history.
Some of them wish to cling to the classic principle of restorationism. The local congregation as the essence of Christ's body, anti-clericalism and the devaluation of theology. Others, on the other hand, largely well-educated leaders at Chicago and Vanderbilt and Yale saw the mission of disciples to foster extreme ecumenicity, to build the one great coming church that Jesus envisioned in John's Gospel, to engage in international biblical and theological dialogue, and to improve financial support for the internal programs of the Brotherhood. Consequently, a restructure process was initiated in the 1960s, which led to the showdown, and the roles were cleared of over uh, half a million members related formally to the Disciples uh, Christian Church. Today, uh, the Disciples report about 4,200 congregations in the United States and 37 in Canada. The debate over restructure was acrimonious and led to further dismemberment. Those opposing the plan believed that it threatened the freedom and autonomy of local churches. On the other side, proponents of the new church, and they called it that, built a new comprehensive theology which manifests itself organizationally in free and voluntary relationships, but it is characterized at local, regional, and national levels by integrity, self-government, authority, rights, and responsibilities. Alexander Campbell turned in his grave. As the 20th century evolved, Canadian disciples developed their own full-fledged machinery for their brotherhood. When the All-Canada Movement was undertaken in 1922, Canadian disciples agreed to a national paper, a national headquarters, a national chief executive, and a national fund. The financial plan involved voluntary but budgeted annual contributions from the provinces. Authority proceeded from the local congregations upwards to delegated authority in national agencies. What emerged from the ongoing Disciples Christian Church in Canada was basically a small region of the United States body on the one hand, but on the other a listing all of their own as a fully organized Canadian church body in the Canadian Council of Churches. The idea of brotherhood on both sides of the border had been obscured by a more complicated structure which has all but destroyed Alexander Campbell's notion of cooperative, voluntary communities. To conclude, first, mission involvement, strong leadership like the Campbells and the Foxes and others, benevolence financing and social concern compelled these four groups, the Mennonites, the Baptists, the Quakers, and the Disciples, to create permanent communal relationships and support structures. With the Mennonites at one side of the spectrum and the Disciples at the other, these four examples of free church theology and polity, each inheriting voluntary consciences and yet the need to cooperate, created workable patterns. In some cases, it was a long and torturous evolution, but that's the nature of the free church. Each of the paradigms developed a unique metaphor to express freedom and interdependence, or in another way, voluntarism and community. These metaphors reflect the doctrine of the church as maintained by each, the community, the association, the meeting, the brotherhood, all four traditions, moreover, were shaped by their context. Political unification, revivalism, missionary endeavor, ecclesiastical competition, religious toleration, and schism. Leadership with a vision for greater organizational development, always those far-sighted Alexander Campbell models, and complexity to go along with it, was a significant catalyst in the transformation of each.
as finally as the original forces of volunteerism are bridled, that is, slow down, brought into community, new dissenting congregations and leaders exercise their own voluntary prerogatives to create yet more purely voluntary bodies. I like the vision, having read a good deal of the statements pro and con, I like the vision of a modern voluntarism expressed by a man named W. Barnett Blakemore, a keen student of free church theology in the dissenter tradition of the disciples of Christ. He wrote, the Holy Spirit is never private. He is always communal, making community. What the Holy Spirit does is to build within us those structures of intimate and compassionate understanding of each other, which inspires us to build between each other and to act with other men and God through the structures by love. And by building structures of understanding within and communion without, the Holy Spirit leads us into truth and continues to set us free. Thank you.